Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started on time. Um, welcome to this actually exciting side event by the Arctic Council of Ministers. And without waiting any longer, um, because we have a very tight and full and wonderful schedule, uh, I want to introduce Stefan Skaldersson, who is representing the um, Icelandic Arctic Council Chairmanship. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, minister, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me at the outset to welcome all of you to this event. All aboard tackling polar ocean acidification organized by the Arctic Council. And I would in particular welcome the Minister of Environment and Natural Resources of Iceland, Mr. Guðmundur Ingi Guðmundsson, who has been kind, so kind as to offer some introductory remarks at this event. And of course, also a warm welcome to the panelists. Sustainable development and protection of the Arctic environment have been at the core of the Arctic Council since its founding in 1996. Its role today is even more important than ever before due to ever more rapid environmental changes. The ocean and the seas around us in the Arctic are, so to speak, at the heart of Arctic life, both on land, in the sea, and on the ice. In light of the enormous changing that is taking place, including in the oceans, in the Arctic, the chairmanship and the Arctic Council decided to organize an event at the COP25 with a focus on the acidification of the polar ocean resulting from the melting of the polar sea ice and glaciers and increased carbon dioxide absorbed by the ocean, not least in polar areas. This is of great concern, and we are therefore very happy to have such prominent experts and scientists participating in our panel today, focusing on the different aspects of the acidification of the polar ocean. This event is organized as a panel where each panelist will give a presentation on different aspects of polar ocean acidification. This will be followed by a summary of, a, of key points from the presentations <coughs> and an outlook on ongoing and upcoming work at the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program of the Arctic Council. Now, the panelists that we are lucky to have here today are Ms. Koparet, who is vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And she will speak about the recent IPCC report, special report on oceans and cryosphere. We have Mr. Professor Richard Bellerby, who is director of the SKLEC NIVA Center for Marine and Coastal Research from the East, Anglia, East China Normal University at Shanghai and the lead researcher at the Norwegian Institute for Water Research in Bergen, in Norway. We have Dr. Helen Findley. She is a biological oceanographer at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. The she will talk about the impacts of ocean acidification and Arctic species ecosystems. And then we have Lisa Koperkualak, Vice President of, the, uh, of International Affairs for the Inuit Circumpolar Council in Canada. And she will speak about the effects of ocean acidification on Inuit communities. And then we finally have Mr. Rolf Rödven, who is Executive Secretary of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. He will sum up, sum up what is being said here today and also inform us about ongoing and upcoming work of the AMAP related to acid, acidification of the ocean. I will introduce all speakers in a little more detail uh, when they take the floor, but I will start by, start by uh, our guest here today, Mr. Guðmundur Ingi Guðbansson, Minister for Environment and Other Resources of Iceland. Mr. Mr. Guðbransson uh, became minister in Iceland on 30 November in 2017, two years ago. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Iceland and a master's degree from, on environmental management from Yale University. He was the CEO of Landbert, which is the Icelandic Environment Association, from 2011 until he became minister two years ago. He has also worked at Icelandic universities, both as researchers and 
and in different capacities also uh, with focus on, on, on uh, land sciences, soil conservation, etc. And he has been a guest lecturer at the University of Iceland, also the Agricultural University of Iceland and the University of the, of the West Fjords. Uh, I think I will leave this introdu introductory comments at that and ask the minister to take the floor. Mr. Gibson, please. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see so many people here and probably as many or even more in, in uh, Stockholm. When uh, you were introducing me, you reminded me that I once wanted to become a scientist. I uh, studied biology and environmental sciences. Um, perhaps I dreamt of standing in front of a crowd like you and talk about science, like we have many scientists coming here after me. But I had to become a politician to be able to do that. Another good thing that follows when you are a politician and you're asked to do things like this, you get to sit in the front and you can see everything so clearly. So there are many benefits um, of the job, as you can see. Uh, but it's really an honor for me to be here and to deliver some opening remarks at this uh, event. Now, we all know that the Arctic is facing an unprecedented change, and the Arctic Council is the premier pol political forum to address many issues facing the eight Arctic countries and the indigenous peoples of the high north. Iceland also takes very seriously any changes in the marine environment. Fisheries are a mainstay of, the Iceland's, of Iceland's economy. So any threats to the marine environment and ecosystem is of concern to Icelandic society. And let me also say that I'm happy to be here in the Cryosphere Pavilion today. Chile has, in its presidency, put emphasis on the oceans and also on what scientists call the cryosphere, which is the technical term for the frozen realm of our planet. See, this is one of the reasons why I did not really become a scientist. Um, yeah, the frozen realms of our planet, glaciers, sea ice, and permafrost. This has been called the blue cup, but it's also a cool cup, we could say, and nowhere is, meeting, is, nowhere, um, is this meeting cooler than exactly here in the cryosphere pavilion. And that was supposed to be a very good joke, but anyways. <laughs> uh, it was worth trying, at least. Um, perhaps nowhere can the impacts of the changing climate be seen more clearly than in the Arctic. The warming of the Arctic has been about twice the global average, and uh, the changes are more visible than in most other places. Sea ice, for example, has retreated dramatically in recent decades. Arctic and subarctic glaciers are retreating, and in Iceland we have lost about 50 small glaciers out of some 300 in total since 2000, and it became famous worldwide when we said goodbye to one of our glaciers um, in, the, in, in August, uh, called Ork. And we know that a warming of two degrees Celsius or more will most probably in the long term mean Iceland without ice. So then probably our country will be called land, not Iceland. Um, other changes are less visible. They, that doesn't mean that they are less important. The effects of a changing climate on the oceans are vast. Um, and we are only now starting to realize how profound these changes are, thanks to the researchers like we will hear from here today. It could be said that the ocean is an unsung hero in the saga of our changing climate. It absorbs most of the increased heat in the atmosphere. It also takes up a quarter or so of the carbon dioxide that humankind pumps into the atmosphere. Without the sea, the atmosphere would have warmed much faster. But this service comes with a cost. Warming seas affect many marine organisms from tiny plankton to huge coral reefs. And then we have the ocean acidification, a problem that sounds technical and hard to grasp, but should concern all of us. In short, the absorption of CO2 into marine waters causes a change in chemistry and the pH of the sea. And many, and many mar marine organisms are very sensitive to such changes. Mass extinctions of marine life have been tied to acidification events in the past. At current rates, we are soon approaching acidification levels which have not been seen in 55 million years, at a time of one of Earth's 
Earth's biggest mass extinction events. If that sounds alarming, then it's because it is alarming. We are conducting a dangerous experiment with life in the sea. We could perhaps say that we humans are, are landlubber species. We know much less about the ocean than about dry land. It's often said that we have mapped the topography of the moon and even of Mars better than that of the ocean floor. Science is moving, is moving on frontier of knowledge in this respect. We understand ocean acidification much better now than a few decades ago when it was first mentioned as a concern. We know that acidification is a threat to species such as shellfish and corals. Tropical coral reefs are the richest marine ecosystems on Earth and are currently under severe stress. But the tropics are not the only region we should worry about. Some of the fastest rates of ocean acidification anywhere are occurring in the Arctic, including in the waters north of my country, Iceland. Change is already evident in the Arctic Ocean. At the global level, the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere, published just a few months ago, has advanced our knowledge on the effects of environmental changes on marine life and system. <clears throat> Acidification will affect many organisms that are important in the marine web of life. Maybe we feel disconnected from the plight of plankton and clams in changing Arctic waters, but we shouldn't. Science tells us that the changes underway can affect fisheries and the economies and societies in the high north. Not to mention the every right of every species um, to um, persisting on the planet. Intrinsic rights of nature, but let's not go into that. Many think of the Arctic as a near pristine and empty wilderness. Indeed, much of it is uninhabited with unique ecosystems and natural wonders. And as a minister for the environment, I would like to see us conserving this heritage. We need more natural, uh, natural parks and national parks and protected areas on a planet transformed by human activity. But the Arctic is also a place which some four million people call home. It is a region of rich heritage and cultural diversity. It is the ancestral home of indigenous peoples who have learned to live on the bounty of Arctic waters by ingenuity and wisdom gathered through millennia. And that is important. The vast changes we are seeing now in the Arctic is a threat to livelihoods, society, and cultures in the region. In Iceland, we see marine species moving north with warming waters. Many of us who are in this room will probably live to see ice-free summers in the Arctic Ocean. We will see an entirely transformed Arctic in this century. This is hardly avoidable, but our task is to avoid the worst case scenarios to preserve the Arctic as much as we can. We have advanced our knowledge in part by the efforts of the scientists that are giving presentations here today and the organizations they represent. Still, many questions remain. I am alarmed at the findings of uh, AMAP and others that fisheries can be severely affected by, by ocean acidification. Fisheries is a pillar of the Icelandic economy and many other economies around the world. But this concerns not only the inhabitants of the high north, the Arctic and sub-Arctic sub regions yield a tenth of global commercial catch of fish. I recently announced increased governmental support for research and monitoring on as ocean acidification in Icelandic waters, including the likely impact on marine life. This is in line with the recommendations of AMAP. I also want to mention that the Nordic environment ministers have taken two common measures this year to better conserve the oceans. First, at our meeting in Reykjavik in, Ap in April this year, we signed a declaration to support and push for the establishment of an international treaty on plastic pollution and, plastic re re and reduction of plastic release into the oceans. And secondly, in October, we all signed a declaration on the climate and the oceans, emphasizing the importance of the oceans, of carbon neutrality, of marine protected areas, and the importance for more action. <clears throat> Most importantly, we should avoid doing more harm that has already been done. The Arctic and the oceans are undergoing vast change due, due to emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. 
We need to halt and reduce emissions. This cannot be stressed enough. This is a matter of urgency for the Arctic and for the planet Earth. We need to do this, each and every country, and we need to do this together. We do need all aboard. The Arctic is, is sounding a global alarm. We should all listen and we should all act. Thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to listening to both the presentations and the discussions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Skudbrandsson, for your words. Very thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation uh, you gave us here today. Uh, now we turn to the panelists. Uh, and the first speaker on my list is, uh, is Mr. Ko Barrett. Uh, Ms. Barrett is uh, the vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. She has for, for over 15 years represented the United States on delegations charged with negotiating and adopting scientific assessments undertaken by the IPCC. And she is widely recognized as an expert on climate policy particularly on issues related to climate impacts and ways to help society to adapt. She has won numerous awards in her life, including uh, the Nobel Peace Prize she shared with the, the panel, IPCC panel in 2007. And with those words, Ms. Barrett, I give you the floor where you will uh, present the IPCC special report on the oceans and cryosphere. You have the floor, madam. Thank you, everyone. It's really a pleasure to follow the minister who, uh, despite not growing up to be a scientist, is actually quite an effective uh, translator of science in the policy context, so that's wonderful. Uh, and I'm happy to be here uh, today in my role as IPCC vice chair to share some of the findings um, of the report that we released in September on oceans and cryosphere, the frozen realm, in a changing climate. I'm also going to take a little time to uh, discuss the ways in which our special report complements and, in fact, supports the findings that came out of the Arctic Council's 2018 report on Arctic Ocean acidification. I think you'll see that there is a consistency to the science findings. Hooray. Um, but before I go into the science findings, I want to share a story that um, in September, I had the chance to visit the Arctic for only the second time in my life. I went uh, up to Alaska, where I held a series of meetings with indigenous communities to hear about the ways that climate change is already impacting their lives. Because I knew I would be asked to do some communication on our report, and I was finding it difficult to just talk about the facts, 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 facts without having a human face uh, around which to uh, think about the impacts that this was having on communities who are so uh, dependent uh, on the environment for their uh, subsistence. So um, despite the fact that I will now go into a number of facts on science, I want you to know that all of this needs to be held in the context of what this means for people in the Arctic. So as the minister said, our oceans have been acting like a sponge. It's virtually certain that the ocean has absorbed more than 90% of the excess heat in the climate system and very likely has also absorbed between 20 to 30% of the total anthropogenic CO2 um, put into the atmosphere over the last few decades. And just to kind of put this in context for non-scientists, what happens is excess carbon dioxide enters the ocean and reacts with water to form carbon, carbonic acid, which decreases the ocean pH and lowers carbonate ice ion concentrations. Aragonite, one of the more soluble forms of calcium carbonate, is widely used by marine calcifiers to build their structures. So therefore, aragonite saturation state is commonly used to track ocean acidification. That's the end of my science lecture. But it's important to understand aragonite because we talk about it a little bit in our findings. So our report found that Arctic ecosystems are likely to cross biological thresholds related to ocean acidification 
sooner than many other ocean regions. Specifically, polar oceans are likely to be undersaturated with respect to aragonite year round by the end of this century under the highest emission scenarios. This very likely presents following tall people, thank you. Uh, this very likely presents elevated risks for keystone aragonite shell forming species due to crossing an aragonite stability threshold year round in the polar and subpolar oceans by the end of this century. More broadly, warming, ocean acidification, reduced seasonal sea ice extent, and continued, continued loss of multi-year sea ice are projected to impact polar marine ecosystems through direct and indirect effects on habitats, populations, and their viability. The geographic range of Arctic marine species, including marine mammals, birds and fish, is projected to contract, while the range of some subarctic fish communities is projected to expand, further increasing pressure on high Arctic species. All of this clearly has implications for Arctic communities. The AMAP and the IPCC reports present complementary messages on ocean acidification in the north high latitudes. Similar to the rest of the globe, ocean acidification is progressing as a result of continued carbon emissions. However, the polar oceans are especially vulnerable to atmospheric emissions because colder seawater naturally absorbs a greater fraction of CO2. Both reports indicate that in addition to increasing atmospheric CO2, Arctic ocean acidification is exacerbated by local processes such as sea ice loss and changes in primary productivity that are unique to the region. Therefore, it's important to evaluate Arctic ocean acidification through a lens of a multi-stressor framework, and I know that AMAP is looking at this. Both reports that um, demonstrate that Arctic communities are especially vulnerable to such changes and are, in some cases, reaching adaptation limits. It's important to note that extreme sea level, ocean warming, and acidification are occurring in combination and are driving the vulnerability of Arctic communities. So in 2018, the Arctic um, Ocean Acidification Report featured an Alaska case study on the socioeconomic impacts of ocean acidification in fishery-dependent communities. The case study revealed that the impacts across the state are e uneven and are closely tied to the community's ability to reduce dependency on impacted fisheries. In the case of, for example, the, king, uh, red, uh, the red king crab. So for example, southern Alaska faces the greatest risk due to the dependence on sus susceptible species for nutrition and income the forecasted rapid change in chemical conditions, and as a rural area, its low job diversity, employment and education levels, as well as its high food costs. So I'm aware that the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration in the US is supporting research and monitoring efforts in the Gulf of Alaska, Bering and Chukchi Seas to understand the progression, variability and impacts of ocean acidification has on these ecosystems and ultimately the communities that depend on them. I know that these studies include laboratory studies on the response and vulnerability of deep sea corals, shellfish, and fish, sustained monitoring programs that support moorings, research cruises, and autonomous sampling, modeling studies that utilize biologi biological sensitivity and environmental data to forecast ocean acidification events, predict the biological response of commercially important species and understand the socioeconomic impacts on communities that depend on these fisheries. In closing, I'd like to say that the changes that are documented in the Arctic are sweeping and severe. And while not directly experienced by much of the Earth's population, these changes are important all across the globe. These changes to these remote areas show that even, and especially there, human-induced warming and ocean change is evident. This is a clear call to action. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ms. Parrish. It's very interesting, thought blogging and the report from the IPC on the cowshare and oceans. Thank you for the report as well. It is all new information is, is vital for those who are working on policy issues to base their policies on. So my next speaker on the list is uh, Professor Richard uh, Bellerby. Uh, Dr. Bellerby is the director of the SKLEC NIVA Center for Marine and Coastal Research at East China Normal University in Shanghai, as well as a lead researcher at the Norwegian Institute for Water Research in Bergen, in Norway. Uh, Mr. Bellerby uh, has many scientific, had many scientific roles, including he's a leader of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program and the Scientific Committee on Arctic, Antarctic Research, the Ocean Acidification Working Group, and he is also uh, the executive, he is also uh, the executive committee member of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Networks. Uh, I will leave my uh, list at that and invite Mr. Bellaby to to take take the floor and speak on the key findings of the AMAP Arctic Ocean Acidification Report. Mr. Bellaby, you have the floor. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's always daunting to follow such great orators, but uh, as a scientist, I have the opportunity to, to use uh, overhead so I can disguise some of my uh, not quite polished communication skills as you two have shown already. Uh, thank you for the excellent introduction. Um, I did promise at the press conference that I would also not go into too much carbonate chemistry, but you explained uh, a significant part incredibly well, Co. I also have uh, the job of presenting something on which I had nothing to do in the writing. This, um, the key findings are developed by AMAP and the policy documents and the scientist's role is purely to acknowledge that they are scientifically correct. However, I have tried to integrate uh, parts of the scientific report along with, the key, with each key finding just to, well, to help me also uh, with my flow. And uh, let's begin. Those of you which have not read this report, it's a jolly good read. Um, it's freely available on the AMAT report. I shouldn't say that about something that I've written, but uh, oh, I, I had, a, had a role in writing. Um, it goes through uh, theory of art, uh, Arctic, Arctic um, acidification. It explains the chemistry. It explains the observations and models of the changes which we have observed, which, me, uh, which we uh, simulate could happen under different climate uh, CO2 scenarios. It also eval evaluates from the species to the functional group level, from phytoplankton all the way through to corals and any part of the food web which we have determined could be or has been shown to be sensitive to ocean acidification. And then there is a significant section which is new to this form of reporting where we have gone through several regional or fishery type based assessments of the potential direction and magnitude of significant fisheries, including uh, the Alaskan case study as was just being discussed. But more to the point from, for, the, for my remit for this is we have condensed a lot of the scientific findings down in a policy report, 
And very simply, recommendations, first one not very surprising, you hear this a lot, that we urge the, the members of the Arctic uh, Council and its observer countries and global society to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide as a matter of urgency. I don't think I'm the only one saying that here this, uh, this, this two weeks. And again, it's often a cry from researchers, but we didn't write this. We need more money to do more research. <laughs> but there is a, we, the, the report really shows the gaps. It shows the regions of fastest change presently, the, the, reason, the regions which will go out of the present environment window, the regions which can be targeted. Maybe they are of high economic pro, uh, um, uh, significance, or they have a large biodiversity significance, so they can be adopted potentially as marine protected areas uh, and also used for nature-based solutions. And although we have that knowledge, there are very few, and it's very good to hear that one of the best, the longest uh, time series station is in Iceland waters, funded by the Iceland government, and we want to try and move this up into the higher Arctic. We, we, it's a, a lot of our uh, results are based on individual cruises or short-term short observations, and a lot is reliant on models. And also adaption strategies. I will go into the end about ex extend on the socioeconomic aspects, and I know that will be followed up in the summary as well, that we have to implement very quickly adaption strategies um, tailored to local and societal needs. These changes are not something which happened by the end of the century. We're already going past thresholds or by now. We've already out of the uh, physiological windows for many organisms, especially along the, the coastal systems. So this has to be put into place very quickly. So let's put some words behind those statements or some figures. I'm very glad I remembered to put the Iceland time series on this scene, the Iceland minister is here. You see how obvious the pH is dropping in the Iceland Sea. What is also more concerning is that from the little we know about the higher Arctic and from models, it's happening even faster the further north you go. Uh, and m no more so in the East Siberian shelf regions. This is the omega aragonite saturation state. Anything below one and a unprotected shell of aragonite will dissolve in seawater. Anything below 1.5, it's a nominal uh, threshold which has been observed through experimentation and also in um, uh, and, and observations. Um, the pteropods, the uh, as well, as well as being incredibly significant in the global carbon cycle and the food web, they are the polar bear of the ocean acidification. They're some of the cutest things. I'll show, I'll show one of them dissolving in a few minutes. It's a bit sad, but it's true. Um, you can already see in the East China Sea, we're in, we're in an, a, a system which is perturbed by organic carbon, uh, as well as anthropogenic carbon uh, supplies to the shelf. And this region is expanding rapidly. Yes, the primary driver of ocean acidification is uptake of CO2 emitted by anthropogenic activities. That's been said by both previous um, speakers. What is, on a basin scale, very special about the Arctic, it has such a close land-ocean uh, connectivity. It's not just atmospheric CO2 coming from the, south, uh, from, from, from the atmosphere. It receives anthropogenic carbon from the Pacific and the Atlantic. It's like a depository. We have massive uh, ocean acidification highways which are feeding from the sides. But we also, as I said just now, organic carbon is increasing from permafrost uh, erosion. The freshening is also something which I'll show later has big consequences for the rate of pH and aragonite drop. And also the removal of sea ice. Conventionally, 
the surface uh, Arctic Ocean is generally under the atmospheric CO2. As, it tra as the water travels north, it cools, and the, CO the partial pressure of CO2 goes down. So it's generally undersaturated. It, won't, it has the potential to take a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere. But this lid actually stops it generally reaching equilibration. So the normal situation for, for Arctic water under the ice is below the atmospheric. When you remove that ice, then you get equilibration with the atmosphere very quickly, or within a year. So actually the change of CO2 that's seen there is much greater than any change we would see anywhere else in, in the ocean in, res in response to the atmospheric CO2 increases. So you have all these different drivers really making it a very sensitive place. And I've just said this. <laughs> So the Arctic is especially vulnerable, I've just explained it. It has an inherently low carbonate ion concentration and low salinity, which means for every one unit of carbon addition, the resultant reduction in pH or omega is larger than in, in other oceans. That's the biggest sensitivity driver. But it also has this water, uh, carbon coming in from the side and this land-based carbon and freshwater input. So I, I was speaking ahead of this, of my time, or ahead of this slide. It's very hard to generalize as well about acidification in the Arctic. It is very, very heterogeneous. Um, uh, this is bottom water, which we published a couple of years ago. I can balance it. I work in European waters, so I generally show European slides. The Americans talk about the Pacific side and the Chichi Sea and things. So. Uh, but you can see over very short distances, even though this is a a model, it's very hard to simulate what will be the future situation exactly in that fishery, exactly for that nursery gr ground. So again, this is where we need some more input to observations. But it's also very important when it comes to, we're going to be talking about the um, SDG 14.3 later this afternoon, the national re requirement to report your pH value of your country. The complexity, even at this uh, broad scale, is very high, which means we really do have to get some significant monitoring programs into the coast, especially the coastal and shelf Arctic, to enable countries to be able to deliver their obligation to the SDG. Uh, this, is, this talk is going to be followed up by uh, a talk on biological responses, so I will be brief. But marine ecosystems are highly likely to undergo significant change due to ocean acidification. Uh, don't worry, it was only a, a figurative dissolution of a pteropod. I wasn't going to show one actually dissolved live in front of you. But that's it. see how quickly it happens. And um, put, it, put, it, put, it, put a shell in seawater uh, representing 2,100 uh, business as usual scenario and that, cell, that shell will dissolve in 45 days. That's a lot of energy that organism needs to maintain its integrity. There's a little bit of hope on the horizon, but this is purely from experimental results. If you grow certain calcifiers, the, in this case, uh, uh, the coccolithophore, uh, E. huxleyi, for three years, it has shown to be more resistant to CO2 and to be even to be helped by warming. But I don't want the story that life is fine. This is in an experiment. It has no predators, there's no viruses, there's no other challenges to the system. But I think there is uh, something that we should significantly, we should follow up with, uh, with a matter of urgency. Through these biological changes, ocean acidification will have direct and indirects on Arctic marine life. It's a, I wouldn't say it's a complex ecosystem, it's a very simple ecosystem. It's called a truncated food web. If you lose one, just one of these trophic levels, or one of these organisms, it's not obvious, as is the case in a lot of the other global ocean, that another organism, organism can just step in. So you can actually get a break in the, in the link from nutrients to whales, or nutrients to polar bears, or nutrients to walruses, if you remove one of these uh, uh, functional groups. 
Again, I do apologize for promoting my work, but I do like this figure. Um, you can't see it either at the back, so I'm going to have to talk you through it. It's very... As well as ocean acidification, the next uh, AMAP report will be discussed later in this session. But we have to think about multiple stresses now. Ocean acidification and warming do not happen on, the, on, their, on their own. Uh, the Arctic is a, is, a, is a dustbin for microplastics. The same currents that are bringing the anthropogenic carbon is pumping plastic into the Arctic. You have massive Arctic darkening because of the organic carbon. You have massive Arctic lightning because of the removal of sea ice. Uh, you have ship noise. You have ship pollution. You have invasive species, etc., etc., etc. There's a very, very complex changes. These are all happening and should all be them studied together, depending on your ecosystem or your region. Key finding eight, ocean acidification is one of several factors that may contribute to the alteration of fish species uh, composition in the Arctic. There are direct effects that Helen will uh, talk about where um, the survival of uh, eggs and, no and nauplii and juvenile, f and juvenile fish um, is sensitive to ocean acidification, not the big fish. A whale is not particularly directly sensitive to, OA, to the pH, but the clams are, the phytoplankton are, the, zoo, the zooplankton are. So you can get very big shifts in uh, the fisheries potential, the fisheries, uh, the species, uh, through these individual uh, species and functional group uh, changes. This is, uh, this is the figure that, that Ko was talking about, showing the different fisheries and regional sensitivity, depending on whether you are fishing for salmon or whether you are fishing for, for, for crab and, and other examples, along with the type of community. Some have boats that can go a long way, very adaptive. Um, others have very high value. They can afford to invest. Others are very small, very small communities and cannot change to, to go that uh, further distance or, or, or change the season of their fishing, for example. So this is in the report as well. And separately to this, if you, if you read, well, when, not if, when you read the SROC report and, talk, and look at the, the, the migration of fisheries Yes, there is a challenge to invasive species, but a lot of the fishermen and the politicians are thinking, great, we've got more, more area, more fish. But when it comes for the livelihoods of Arctic peoples who have that cultural and also that um, infrastructure uh, connection to the sea, yes, your pelagic fisheries will increase, but the very strong connection to in invertebrates, your clams or your oysters or whatever your... Uh, your shellfish, which again can go to the Norwhale, directly to the walrus, go directly to the Norwhale, then you have a, a very strong cultural and locally economic consequences of ocean acidification. So I will return to the final slide. I don't need to go through it by the time. You can read it because I only outlined it before, but this is, what, this is the message we sent to the Arctic Council. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Bellaby. Uh, Mr. Bellaby, for this presentation, very, very interesting, and uh, this is science that we need to base our work on onwards, going forward. Uh, the next speaker uh, on the panel is Dr. Helen Findlay. Uh, Dr. Findlay is a biological oceanographer at the Plymouth Marine Laboratories in the UK, who uses a combination of experimental observational and method modeling tools to investigate the impacts of climate change and ocean acidification on marine organisms and ecosystem functioning with a particular focus on Arctic regions. Uh, she is currently a member of the Executive Council of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network and lead coordinator for the Northeast Atlantic Ocean Acidification Regional Hub of GOA-OIN. Uh, Dr. Findlay, 
we are excited to hear from you. You have the floor. Thank you very much, um, and thank you to the Arctic Council for inviting me to participate in this event. It's a real privilege to be able to share some of the biological responses um, uh, of the Arctic Ocean. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, background to some of the, summarise some of the results from the report, but then go into a bit more of unpacking those studies to explain how some of these ecosystem impacts are likely to come out um, and how the interactions between species responses may result in food chain responses. Um, I apologise, I'm suffering from a bit of a cough and cold, so if I cough all the way through this, I really do apologise. So this is another image of a food web. Um, the Arctic Council report, the AMAP report, really tried to cover as much as possible of the food web um, as is uh, available in the literature, um, ranging right through from viruses through to zooplankton, which are uh, plankton, planktonic animals that float around in the sea, phytoplankton, the, the algae of the sea, through to fish um, and hydrotrophic levels. So as you can see from this graph here, this is um, the total number of studies that were used in the Arctic Council report, 186 studies on ocean acidification. But what's important to note is that actually only 40% of those studies are from Arctic-specific or subarctic-specific studies, which means that we really lack a lot of the detailed knowledge that we need to understand Arctic-specific processes. And so what we're trying to do is uh, take away principles and mechanisms from the studies that we've done at lower latitudes to look at how we can apply those to the northern um, communities and the northern uh, food webs because at the moment we just don't have the ability to get to the Arctic um, as much as we would like to be able to study something that is actually an ongoing experiment. And we need to know the important processes that are going on now so that we can make predictions and enhance our ability to predict. So the key findings, I'm going to go straight to the conclusions from the report really, where the ocean acidification has the potential to drive change in marine systems. Change can either come directly on specific species or it can come indirectly through um, different effects on the interaction between species. The likely, likely there's going to be a great heterogeneity in responses. Some responses of organisms will be positive, some are negative, um, and some will have no response. And I'll go through a little bit more of those aspects in detail in a minute. But we're really, my point here is that we need to understand these mechanisms and the processes, some of the key biological processes and mechanisms so that we can apply those to Arctic communities. So this is a summary slide actually from a paper that was released in 2013, Kirsty Croker's work, um, where she reviewed um, at that time the available ocean acidification and literature. Um, and as you can see, the red and pink uh, markers indicate negative responses, yellow indicates a neutral response, neither positive or negative, green represents a uh, positive response, and grey is where there was no studies done at that time. So you can see there's a, quite a lot of red and pink, um, and only a couple of greens. The greens potentially uh, are mostly in algal species, so fleshy algal and phytoplankton, tend to respond positively to ocean acidification because of the enhanced CO2, allowing them to increase photosynthesis. That's not always the case, but it seems to be the general trend. Whereas the calcifying organisms you have on the far side, the calcified algae, the corals, the coccolithophores, mollusks, echinoderms, all those organisms that rely on shells, build shells, tend to generally have a negative response. One of the key things we learned from these reviews is that most of the experiments done to date have been done on single species experiments. And that's a concern for us because we need to start thinking about multiple stresses, but also multiple interactions between species. As you can see, there's also been a big focus on calcifying species, and there are varying response. I'll just give a little update on fish, because there wasn't many studies done in 2013 on fish, specifically for the Arctic. Uh, the top 29 most landed fish, if you go by uh, tons, 
in the Arctic and subarctic, just seven species of those have been looked at with response to ocean acidification, and that should be a concern to us. We need to investigate those. Eleven studies were carried out on those seven species. Eight of those showed negative responses to ocean acidification. Most of them were on the early life stages and the larvae and the eggs, and only three showed neutral responses. Um, which is important because if you look at the SROC report, which suggests that fisheries are going to be moving northward, those projections don't yet include any of those effects of ocean acidification. So I'm going to go a little bit more into the uh, biology um, and hopefully explain to you some of the mechanisms that are associated with how ocean acidification impacts species. And really, I think the key thing to think about is that energy matters. If you think of an organism, it's, um, you can think of it as a box of energy. It needs food to take in energy, it needs energy to maintain itself, to move, to metabolize, to regulate its growth. It needs to process energy, to calcify, if it's a calcifying organism, to grow and reproduce. And that can affect its survival and associated processes that link to ecosystem state and function. Um, Several years ago now, we conducted a study where we looked at um, calcifying organisms and we found that they were actually able to maintain their calcification shells. Um, we did a multiple, um, we did a study on different organisms. If you follow the blue line, um, if you have live animals with calcified material, they're actually able to maintain their calcifying, their calcified shells under um, low pH conditions, so under aragonetic um, undersaturated conditions. Um, whereas if you get the dead, the shell itself, just a, a piece of shell material or a piece of arm in the case of a brittle star, and put that into um, undersaturated aragonite conditions, then it will just dissolve away. So what this is, is telling us is that live animals are actually able to do something to maintain their shells. Um, but this comes at a cost. If you can't increase the energy, then that comes at a cost for somewhere else. That energy has to come from somewhere. So in the case of brittle stars, that cost came as muscle wastage. In the case of the limpets, it came to reduce growth. And the same with um, the barnacles, they had reduced growth. In the case of mussels, they had a reduced health. So you can see that organisms, even if they're, they're putting more energy into maintaining their shells because they, that's important, they need it to survive, but that's m resulting in them having other impacts as a result. Um, but what we have also found since then is that energy can, if you increase the food supply, you can actually overcome some of these impacts. So in a high food situation for mussels, for example, you can increase growth even at lower, at high CO2 or low pH conditions, and you can increase, uh, you can prevent dissolution or you can reduce the amount of dissolution. So one of the questions then really is, will food supply increase in the Arctic and allow these species to overcome these issues? The SROC report, I think, suggests that about 10 to 20% increase in primary production in the Arctic is expected in the future. But that's a issue, another issue because it's very complicated in the Arctic with the sea ice loss and the nutrient regime may change. Um, so even if that does increase, we have to think about how these organisms are going to get access to that food. One of the things we've also found that, okay, food may increase, but the food quality also feeds back on these organisms. There's been studies done, this is just one example, where phytoplankton, um, the main food source at the bottom of the food chain, have been exposed to low pH conditions, and their change in their energy, their nutrient status, um, comes as a result of that change in the pH conditions. That directly impacts, if you feed that changed phytoplankton to uh, copepods, for example, which are a secondary consumer, a herbivore, then they will change their respiration rates and their development rates, for example, as well, uh, are altered by those changes in nutrient structure. So changes in food quality also can impact indirectly the um, secondary consumers. There's also interactions between predator and prey. We found this was an early study in clownfish, but it's also been shown in pink salmon, which are really relevant to the Arctic. 
um, particularly in the early life stages, the, larvae, the juvenile stages, that if you have a low pH condition, then you, these fish are not able to detect predators. They have a change in their olfactory sensors that decreases their ability to detect um, the cues from predators, and therefore they spend longer in the presence of predators. So actually, in the change of, they're actually, a, it's actually changing the way that the cues are um, being detected by the organisms. So what we see is a decrease in predator avoidance and detection. We also can think about um, what an organism experiences. Ex organisms live in a variable world. In some cases, it's very variable. In the Arctic, it, can, it depends where you live um, for an organism, how much variability it experiences. Generally, what we find is that if an organism experiences a wide level of variability, it tends to have a higher tolerance to change. If it sees less variability in its natural environment, it hasn't developed over hundreds of years, it hasn't evolved to experience, um, to adapt to those changes, and therefore is less likely to be able to respond to change. And this is one example we did in the Canadian Arctic, where we, if you think about behavior as well as something that can expose um, organisms to different environments. Here we have two copepod species, a uh, Calanus species and an Orthiona species, which is much smaller. Uh, the Calanus species uh, is this one which vertically migrates over 200 meters every day and experiences naturally a pH range of maybe between 7.9 and 8.1 which is what the global average pH is going to decrease by in the future. Whereas the Orthiona species in this location don't vertically migrate and don't experience that natural variability. If you then take those species and put them in the laboratory and conduct ocean acidification experiments, you can see from figure A that actually the survival rates of the adults of those species doesn't really get affected by low pH conditions compared to the Othiona, which drop about 40% survival rate in the, higher, in the low pH conditions. And the same for the, the Norpii, the early life stages of those species. And just to finish off, this is one other example of where we can think about uh, processes. Um, most biological processes are related to temperature. They, we call them um, temperature response curves. And this was some recent work by Dolkertal, who looked at the temperature response for egg survival of two fish species, Atlantic cod and polar cod, um, and then uh, looked at the ocean acidification effect on that temperature response curve. And what you can think about is that if you're lower, further down on the temperature response and your temperature is increasing as well as ocean acidification, then maybe the response you see will be a positive response because the temperature and ocean acidification response will interact. Whereas if you're an Arctic species further along towards the top of your temperature range already, then those, those uh, responses are generally going to be a negative response. So I'm just going to summarize really by going back to the food web. And we've seen that increased primary reduction may be possible in the Arctic, but that's still a little bit of an unknown. But it probably will result in a, size in the, a shift in the phytoplankton size structure. Um, but we think that maybe the food quality and the nutritional status of phytoplankton may well change. That will result in changes in key secondary consumers. Um, there may be some uh, responses directly on secondary consumers. Um, but the nutritional uh, impact is probably going to be the one that affects them the most. There's likely to be a change in size in organisms, particularly of the calcified organisms. What we seem to be finding is that they tend to get smaller because they need more energy to remain there, keep their shells. And that can have direct impacts on... We see direct impacts on fish early life stages, but there's also this problem of predator-prey interactions. So there's a complicated set of uh, responses, and I hope I've given you a summary to just highlight how um, these ocean acidification impacts can uh, result in impacts on species and ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Findlay, for this interesting your interesting intro introduction.
And the final picture especially shows that everything is connected in, this, in terms of the ecology of the seas and how they're affected by, by acidification. Um, the final speaker of the panel is Lisa Koperkolak. She is vice president of the International Af of International Affairs at the Inuit Circumpolar Council in Canada. Lisa Kopekulak was born in Putirinituk on the eastern shore of Hudson Bay in northern Quebec. Uh, she had her primary education at her hometown and then later on went to university in the south having earned her a uh, degree, uh, bachelor degree in political science at Concordia University in Montreal and a master's degree in anthropology from Laval University in Quebec City. Uh, her areas of interest include Inuit political and community development and education, justice, law and the northern environment and the Inuit culture and language. I could go on and on about about Lisa and her her accomplishments, both in academia and public service, and as elected representative of her people. But I think we are now hearing uh, the point of view of how as the case as the vacation of the oceans will and may affect people in the region, uh, as as they are the ones that will be in the end taking the consequences of of the changes happening. So, Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. And it's been a real pleasure to hear mention of uh, travel to the Arctic, to Alaska, and the importance of indigenous people from our previous speakers. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to thank the Arctic Council and organizers for this opportunity to share our voice on the effects of ocean acidification on our Inuit communities. Really, how I pronounce my name it may be difficult for most of you, so we say Koperkwaluk, uh, and um, at home, it's Khopekwaluk, uh, based on our mother tongue, Inuktitut, in Canada. I'm the vice president of the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Canada, and I'm here to pass the message about how our healthy ecosystem is central to our identity, our health and well-being, food security, and cultural sustainability. So I would like to take first a moment to tell you about Inuit in the circumpolar world. We are a people, Inuit, who live in the circumpolar region, which makes us an international people. And we have several different names for ourselves. In Chukotka, that is in Russia, we are Yukpeet. In Alaska, there are Inukpeet and Yukpeet. And in Canada, there are Inuvialuit and Inuit. And in Greenland, Galahit Nunat, there are Galahit. But we share one culture and one language. We number over 180,000 Inuit living not only in the circumpolar region, but also in urban areas, in the southern urban areas. Uh, but we call our homeland Inuit Nunat. That means Inuit homeland, where we have lived for thousands of years. So ICC, Inuit Circumpolar Council, holds a general assembly every four years at which delegates from the circumpolar region elect a new chair and an executive council to which I'm part and develop policies and adopt resolutions that will guide the activities of the organization for the coming term, that is the next four years. And the general assembly is the heart of the organization providing an opportunity for sharing information and discussing common concerns, which we have all in the circumpolar region, debating issues, for we are also uh, having different points of views on different issues, 
and strengthening the bonds of all Inuit in the circumpolar region. So in the General Assembly of 2018, um, which where I began my mandate, we concluded with the Utqaqvik Declaration. And Utqaqvik is what used to be called Barrow in Alaska. And that's where our General Assembly took place. And our declaration holds key sections that include sustainable wildlife management and environment and indigenous knowledge. We have over 57, 53 sections in our declaration, but section 27 directs ICC to facilitate the development of international Inuit protocols on the equitable and ethical utilization of indigenous knowledge and engagement of Inuit communities to provide the guidance to international floor, fora, such as the Arctic Council. I'd like to share here the photo of my uh, grandfather um, who raised me as he influenced me for a large part in continuing my education and uh, doing my best to contribute to our Inuit communities. So when I participate to events like this, it is he uh, who, who gives me my foundation and the knowledge. Um, he knew our ways, he was very proud of where we came from, he knew our environment inside and out. He knew all of the land where we live in Nunavik, and he knew everywhere to go on the Arctic uh, uh, waters uh, around Nunavik, because uh, we are a, a coastal people, and um, I like to bring this Inuit knowledge that he, he shared with me um, and to these forums. And I share this indigenous knowledge with scientists and policymakers to understand the Arctic and the changes in our world so we can make decisions based on our collective knowledge. As I mentioned, we are part of the Arctic ecosystem. Inuit culture and biodiversity are intricately tied. Importantly, we are a marine people who depend upon the Arctic sea ice flow edge and polynias for our food security. It is our critical infrastructure, and as many say, it is our highway to travel upon, and it binds us to our culture. Protecting the marine environment and the animals is the utmost importance for us. Indigenous peoples and systems in the Arctic are disproportionately affected by the impacts of global warning, warming. Inuit have been bringing warnings about global warming to the international community as far back as the first Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. ICC is actively participating in international climate change action and policy through our status as an observer to the United Nations. In Canada, we released a National Inuit Climate Change Strategy. ICC also made a significant contribution to the text of the IPCC Special Report on Ocean and Cryosphere, focusing on the importance of Inuit knowledge, Inuit participation, and Inuit self-determination in research, and to the 2018 Arctic Ocean Acidification AMAP assessment. As you heard very well, the Arctic Ocean acidity levels have been increasing at twice the rate compared to the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The loss of sea ice has been connected to increases in acidification in the Arctic. The water in the Arctic is also colder, so it takes up more carbon dioxide and fresh water influx from rivers emptying into the Arctic Ocean, along with melting sea ice, also contributing to the lowering of pH of the ocean. The food web in the Arctic Ocean is very sensitive. 
So a significant increase in the population of one species or the disappearance of another could have dramatic ripple effects on the entire Arctic marine ecosystem. And we are a part of this ecosystem. At the moment, we don't know what the tipping points are for Arctic marine ecosystems. So there is a lot of monitoring research projects underway, and these should continue with Inuit participation and Inuit in the lead. It is very important to include indigenous, or what I call Inuit knowledge, with all these uh, research. I have an example of an Inuit-led uh, conservation area being created and called Bikiala sur Soir, which means the Great Upwelling. Now, Bikiala sur Soir is right between, uh, it's, it's a shared marine area between Canada and Greenland by the Canadian Inuit and by the Greenlandic Inuit. It is the largest polynya in the Arctic and the most biologically productive region north of the Arctic Circle is threatened by social environmental change, including ocean acidification, shipping, tourism, resource exploration, which there is much going on in the Arctic, and climate change. The, the Inuit-led Bikela Sursua Commission began consulting in Inuit communities in 2016. consulting their knowledge and vision for the future of the Polinya. And based on these consultations, the Commission released a report in 2017 with three recommendations. To, to establish an Inuit management authority for the piquela sur soir region. Identify, secondly, identify a protected area comprised of the Polinya and a management zone. These areas would be monitored and managed by Inuit and formally recognized by governments. And three, establish a travel-free zone for Inuit across the Pigela Soksuak region, which is shared by the two countries, allowing Inuit free mobility to visit family and friends, which will support language preservation and cultural ties. And this speaks to the cultural dimensions of resilience and the relationship between indigenous knowledge and mobility on land, water, and ice. So in 2018, an implementation plan was developed that builds on existing monitoring and research plans and identifies ways for communities to be involved in conservation and research for the area. I would also like to mention a new app for environmental monitoring in the Arctic created by Inuit called Siku. And Siku means ice. It is a social media mapping platform and mobile app led by Arctic Eider Society, which is in, on an island in the Hudson Bay off of Quebec, but which is part of Nunavut. It's called Sanikiluak. This, um, this designed app combines Inuit knowledge and tools with digital technology, with applications for youth mobilization and community health, education, and environmental stewardship. It will allow users to develop profiles and add knowledge content to digital inventory and map. Sorry as well as to comment on wildlife and vi various geographic and environmental features such as sea ice and Inuit place names. It allows users to share photos and use mapping and timelines to share stories and make decisions about intellectual property use. It integrates tools for sea ice safety, such as satellite imagery, weather, and tide reports to support informed decision making for community members when traveling on the land. Siku 
is designed to support community-based monitoring and research and is working on educational resources and lesson plans for relevant Inuit education. And to summarize my main message, the importance of utilization of indigenous knowledge and the inclusion of indigenous peoples is essential in adapting to impacts of climate change, including ocean acidification. The recognition of indigenous people's rights and knowledge is crucial to combat climate change, reverse biodiversity loss, and protect the marine environment. And ICC has been leading work on the issue of climate change for decades. And the examples I have just shared with you are but a couple of many initiatives led by Inuit. Working on ocean acidification is no different and we have an equal part to play in local, national and international initiatives to address this issue. Nakormig, thank you very much. I, I forgot to mention that there is, uh, that we have copies of uh, um, memory key that holds the Canadian strategy on climate change, the Canadian Inuit strategy on climate change. If you would like to have one, please uh, let me know. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Kober Kualuk, Kober Kualuk, I hope I'm correct on that. Uh, very interesting to hear uh, the views from the Inuits uh, in Canada and elsewhere. Uh, now, the panel has spoken, so to, so to speak, but we have one more uh, to go who will try to sum up what was said here and maybe give us the highlights of what is what the future holds for the AMAP work on acidification. Is that correct to say? So let me welcome uh, Rol Rudman Rudman to the podium. He is uh, both a PhD and an MBA and is Executive Secretary of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program called AMAP, uh, which is a working group under the Arctic Council and responsible for monitoring and assessing the state of the Arctic region with regard to pollution and climate change issues and their impacts on ecosystems' health. I think I'll leave my introduction on that, Rolf, if that is okay with you, and give, you, give the floor to you to sum up. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction. Dear Minister, dear experts of the panel, and I would say dear old friends of the cryosphere and the Arctic, uh, today we've been hearing in detail about how the processes of ocean acidification take place. and. I, I was uh, announced to have the, the quite complex task of summarizing it, summarizing it now. Um, however, I'll do my, my very best. Uh, I would actually like to start with uh, the minister's intervention on how he emphasized that imp impacts are seen most pronounced in the Arctic, both due to change, but also as the oceans in the Arctic have a really high importance in buffering climate change, 
both by its uptake of CO2 as well as buffering the, the temperature change. However, the acidification rates are rise, rising more rapidly than for the last 55 million years. And this has importance, of course, both to the ecosystems, but also for fisheries and blue economy. We have heard about uh, both on a global scale and, and more specifically on an Arctic scale on how processes are taking place with all its diversities by Cole Barrett and Professor Richard Belby. And Cole introduced us to the ocean as a sponge, taking up 90% of the heat and 20 to 30% of the CO2 that have been emitted. Um, however, the geographic range of Arctic species are about to contract and uh, on, on uh, given place for, for more temporal or near Arctic species. However, we need, we need to look on the effects into a multi, in a multi-stressor approach also for the communities. Professor Bellaby summed up the fi key findings of, the, of our Arctic Ocean Acidification Report, and I will touch upon some of them a bit later, uh, saying that the primary driver for, for Arctic Ocean Ocean acidification is anthropogenic CO2. However, as ice is removed, the, uh, the equilibrium is not reached, and as ice is removed, the uptake of CO2 will increase. The acidification of the, uh, of the oceans are not uniform across the Arctic, and there is high local vari variability. And marine ecosystems systems are highly likely to Influenced, and I was uh, quite astonished to see the shellfish or the shell being dissolved in 14 days, 45 days. Dr. Helen Findlay went into more detail on this and told us how, on how this affects the ecosystems both directly by creating physiological stress on the organism's growth and maintenance or indirectly by alterations of food webs. And underlining that the acidification has the potential to drive change both directly and indirectly. However, it's likely to be great, uh, great heterogeneity in the response, and we do know too little by now due to the low access accessibility of the Arctic. While you could summarize that the impacts are due to energy matters and cost may be on growth, I found it quite illustrative for the complexity of the, of the responses when you could see that even the predator avoidance of pink salmon, if it was right, was affected. So it underlines the importance of a, a multi-stress approach. However, summing this up, I often find, even being a researcher myself, I find scientific evidence being overwhelming and often I find myself explaining my daughters back home on what I'm working with and trying to simplify it a bit. And therefore, before moving on, I hope I can allow myself to include you in how I would sum summarize this for my daughters. <coughs> Actually, by using this uh, official border, bottle of water with sparkling water. And until some minutes ago, it actually had ice in it as well. But due to, I mean, I'm not sure if it's global warming, but at least local warming, the, the ice has disappeared. So let's keep an imaginary ice cube in there, please. So <clears throat> while the main purpose of this water, of course, is to avoid my throat run, running dry while talking, it could also illustrate the acidification processes. So well, first, how does it taste? Uh, does the sparkling water taste different from still water? Well. I guess you could say it's a bit stingy, a bit more sour or tart, you could say. Uh, and this is actually due to the carbon dioxide being pumped into the water, turning into carbon dioxide, as, as it was uh, shown by Richard and co earlier, lowering the CO a bit to about three to four. And to understand the importance of, of temperature, if you think of, of your home and your soda bottles, uh, which of the soda bottles um, contain more bubbles after opening the cap? 
the one in your fridge or the one that you left out on the table? Well, it's actually the temperature of the water that helps dissolve more carbon dioxide in the Arctic. So, so Arctic water bodies uh, are able to dissolve more CO2 compared to warmer water bodies like in the more southern areas. And what about the ice cube that was supposed to be here but has already done its effect? Uh, what, does it, what, does that illust uh, what does that illustrate? Well, let's instead of think of it as an ice cube, think of it as a large glacier or an uh, ice flow or um, like a glacier melting into, into the rivers running into water. It, uh, it uh, flushes a lot of fresh water into the, the ocean. And water is not just water because the pH of oceans are around 8. And, around, and fresh waters have a pH around 7. So the inflow of fresh water into the systems actually lowers the, the pH. <clears throat> so, actually then in this uh, little bottle of water, little Arctic ecosystems, we have the two major uh, forces of, of uh, Arctic Ocean acidification uh, taking place. First, an increased level of CO2 due to the uh, cold water. And second, an inflow of melting ice. And obviously, when it comes to global warming, they always work in company. Quite a magic ball, isn't it? I hope you remember it when you look on your ball later today. Um, so what happens in this little Arctic ecosystem is that uh, the acidification skew the calcium carbonate equilibrium. And without going into the details of chemistry, as was presented earlier, it also makes the life harder for organisms both for shellfish and mollusks, as presented, but also, as it was said, for organisms like prawns, cods, and salmon. So, <clears throat> this is actually what was described in our report, of course, in more detail, uh, that was published last year. Lisa Kupperkalak from the Inuit Circumpolar Council helped us look on, uh, look through the, those details, uh, and tell us on telling us about how this affects uh, their sources of food, livelihood, and culture. And I think it was very well said that ocean is not an ocean, it's a high wealth for travel, and it's providing resources for the livelihood of Arctic uh, indigenous peoples. <clears throat> and subsistence activity requires healthy food webs, not only as food, but Physical, cultural, and linguistic health is dependent on the health stages of the oceans. And nat nature conservation is also cultural conservation. And I would like to emphasize what you said, also shown in the CQ app, on the importance of combining indigenous knowledge and co more conventional research, how it's crucial for understanding climate change, including ocean acidification. Okay, um, just to illustrate uh, Lisa's examples a bit, the, uh, our report uh, also looked on five different case studies to, to look on social and economic, uh, economic impacts of acidification. Um, first, just to, as also Hel mentioned uh, regarding COD, um, the Temperature and, and, and uh, pH levels uh, may work in synergy to affect CODs. And one of our case studies described in, in the report is the Barnes COD study, study. Arctic Ocean's punches well about the weight when it comes to contributions to the global seafood markets. And for Arctic states, seafood is important for the national economy. However, uh, the COD studies show that combined effects of increased temperature in the waters water columns, as well as uh, ocean acidification, could increase the mortality of, of juvenile cod, and hence decrease the recruitment of the stock, cod stock, um, suggesting that to maintain the same kind of management regime in year 2100, fishing potentially may have to be reduced to about one-sixth of the day, which of course have severe impact on harvesting, but also on uh, the livelihood of residents as well as nations.
However, how would such ecological consequences influence societies? Well, to, to uh, investigate the risk, we have to look on both the physical acidification as, as itself, on human exposure, and their vulnerability. And this slide was already presented uh, by Richard and also referred to by Co, showing how different regions, sorry, showing how the resilience of different regions are uh, very diverse among uh, the Arctic communities. And the diversity of income and diversity of organizational structure is what can help us resilient, make us resilient to acidification. Thank you. Thank you for summing, summing us up, Rolf. Uh, very, uh, very well done. And uh, this about the cod, which is very salient to Iceland as well. Uh, what happened to our cod is important to our whole society. Uh, I'm sorry that our time is out, so we have almost no time for questions. Uh, there are other coming at half past. Now we are 32 minutes past. Uh, I can. In five minutes, okay. I see I have a question from the floor. Yes, please. Oh, it's okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Hissai Said. I'm an educational NGO for sustainability called the Juventum. And um, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Findlay and uh, Bellaby, uh, that I think uh, uh, many of the uh, uh, current uh, predictions and assumptions are based on the uh, good historical observations and uh, accumulation of uh, scientific knowledge. And uh, I would like to know a little bit uh, with, in association with uh, uh, what do you call the pa paleontology uh, 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 perspective, like uh, uh, the historical transition of a salt CO2 concentration and the ecosystem transition because from a really old time uh, the climate of this uh, uh, polar region dramatically changed and once it was much much warmer and so on uh, so then also even a harvest of all these uh, uh, animals like a salmon and seal may have uh, good and bad ears uh, and that can be partially connected to and then uh, second quick question is a uh, uh, salmon farm is very, very common in this area and uh, often have an ecological impact uh, on these local things. And uh, also the entire life cycle is in captivity and then maybe it's a kind of a quasi uh, laboratory uh, system that uh, you can have uh, some kind of a monitoring system uh, more easily to uh, observe. So then, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll finish. Uh, so uh, what kind of uh, impact on uh, salmon farm uh, fish and the nearby shellfish, uh, if you have any observations so far? Thank you very much. I think I'll concentrate on the second question. I think when you said paleontology, did you mean paleoceanography, the geological record, the rate of change? Um, well, first, let's go to the salmon question. Yes, when salmon are at feeding times, the CO2 concentration in salmon farm can get very, very high, like 15,000 ppm. It's crazy high. But it's for a very short time, and also sometimes the farmers change the uh, f deliberately change the alkalinity, especially if they're moving. So they are aware of this. I think, especially, it will become more apparent in closed systems because in a fjord system, that high CO2 level is quickly advected away by the water. So it's not really an experiment. It's an experiment on how salmon survive for 30 minutes in high CO2. It's not, it's not equivalent to decadal annual changes. Uh, one thing which has... <laughs> One thing that has come from some of the very intensive salmon farming, which is, out, which is 
becoming less fashionable now is that you see from very local high CO2 worlds because of food loss and excre excretion, it, you can actually monitor this as a, as a natural or a gradient from a high CO2 world into a... So we, we are looking at places like that. We have studied one in, the, in Lofoten Islands. Uh, so we are using salmon farming and ocean acidification research in that way. If I have time to, going back to the first question about, I mean, yes, 55 million years ago, there was a high CO2 world, but it was happening much slower than is happening now. There were different species around then. Lots of the species uh, have evolved since then, so it's a very hard comparison to make. So I, I think it's very hard to couple the two. So. Uh, please join me again in thanking our speakers. Yes, just to, to sum up, thank, thanks to all the speakers from the panel and, and Rolf, to you too as well. Uh, I hope that this has shed some light on what's happening in the Arctic waters. And from the Arctic chairmanship point of view, we have a focus on the oceans and the sea in the Arctic in our chairmanship program, both the economy of, of, uh, of the fisheries management and also the health of the oceans, including acidification and plus and other debris in the, in the oceans. So thank you all for coming and thank you panelists. I, I'm, I apologize for you know, exceeding the time limits. Thank you very much and, and, and have a nice week. Thank you. And then the next event will be quite um, short, probably just 30 minutes, but what we thought it could be useful to do is bring it all together because this focused on acidification, but there are lots of different kinds of impacts that are all coming together. And so we're going to have a dialogue among uh, many of the experts you've just heard from to talk about what the impacts of not just acidification, but other things are likely to be in the polar oceans. So hang around, we'll start in five minutes.
Um, let's see, Carol's coming over, Helen. And what I'm ending up doing is shamelessly stealing some slides from Peter Tour, who a lot of you may know. He works for um, SM Hoey, the Swedish uh, Meteorological and Hydraulic Hydrological Institute. And um, excuse me, if we could move conversations outside or, yeah. Or feel free to listen, because this is about combined impacts. And this is a part of a presentation he actually gave last year. And I'd call this sort of putting it all together. Because we were focused on, of course, acidification in the last event. Um, but part of the issue in the research community, as in the policy community, in the policy community, we often talk about being stovepiped, which means everybody's focusing on their individual issue. And I think that in the research community, there's some of that as well. And the reality, uh, particularly, this focuses on the Arctic Ocean, and I'm just not sure to the degree this holds in the Southern Ocean. You have a bunch of things all happening at once and putting stressors on the system. So in addition to acidification, there's loss of sea ice in the Arctic, what uh, is termed Atlantification, which is moving of uh, warmer waters further north, other warmer latitude, lower latitude species further north, or in the case of the Antarctic, further south. Um, you have freshening of waters. You know, a lot of these were referred to, but what I don't see too often, and so that's why I thought a dialogue along these lines uh, could be helpful, is again putting all these different impacts together. Um, there is the warming. Everyone knows about that, but of course the water's warming as well. Uh, we're seeing occasional marine heat waves, I think primarily in the Bering area. There was a large uh, die-off, mostly of large, from what I understand, marine mammal species this past summer. Uh, that hasn't really been attributed, but it's thought that maybe they were running out of food, maybe the food they normally focus on uh, had moved further north, but regardless, seabirds, whales, uh, in particular, there seem to be quite a few more um, deaths in that part of the world this past summer. Um, this is a photo that, that he does of different sections. I'm not sure this is going to work. Um, you have changes in ocean currents, of course, which has another impact. Again, that is, I'm not an expert on this, so correct me from the, the audience, but I mean, it's, it's motivate, you know, you have both freshening going on, that changes things. Uh, temperature of the water at the higher levels changes the way the different levels mix, and that eventually can bleed down into ocean currents. Is that more or less correct? Okay. Um, so things are changing there as well. Um, and then Atlantification of the Arctic, in other words, you have more Atlantic kind of conditions moving further north. Um, and this is a very complicated slide, but it basically is showing the change of the Barents Sea from what looks more Arctic. And you can see that there was quite a bit more blue on this slide in 1970. And by 2016, when this ended, uh, it basically has Atlantified. In other words, it looks more like the Atlantic Ocean than the Arctic Ocean. Um, this is declines in September sea ice. Uh, the observations are the black line down below. Uh, still sort of going ahead of what the models say, but really you see a, a decline even for RCP 2.6, but at least it stabilizes by the end of the century. In all of the other RCPs, it ends up going down essentially to zero. And here again, keep in mind that the RCPs are not necessarily tracking with reality. And what sea ice experts have been doing over the past few years in particular is trying to put together observations with models and kind of key the models they're using to what they're actually observing. 
And by this way of looking at it, sometime around 1.7 degrees is actually when you start seeing an ice-free Arctic for some period of time. It could be brief most years. And uh, once you get to two degrees, these observation keyed projections show an ice-free Arctic for several months every year. And this probably is going to be more reflected in AR6 because this is fairly new. But that then has a lot of um, implications because we already know that we've lost quite a bit of multi-year ice. And um, these species in the Arctic, a lot of them rely on thick Arctic sea ice in the same way that lower latitude species rely on coral reefs. These are not dead environments. The ice, as you can see from this picture taken from below, is actually quite rich. But if you don't have multi-year ice, you lose this ecosystem. And I think that's a lot of the uh, concern of scientists who are trying to put all of this together. Uh, often there's a focus on polar bears, um, but it's really the entire food chain that is reliant on having this multi-year ice, this thick ice, for longer periods of time. Um, so here again, you're looking at when things are moving from more of an Atlantic point of view to um, from the Arctic point of view. And um, in this context, this was looking at what was said in the 1.5 degree report. And there wasn't a whole lot in there. I mean, and part of this, in all honesty, a lot of the um, cryosphere scientists were, of course, of course, focused on the SROC. So there's really uh, only a couple of sentences, really, in the 1.5 degree report talking about increasing habitat losses uh, for these uh, ice-reliant large species. But really what he is projecting is since you have the complete loss of sea ice, then you have loss of the entire ecosystem, not just these large mammals. And here is a, a you know, graphical representation of this uh, among some of these species on which the entire system relies. And they're reliant on having the ice above them pr to protect them in the winter. And then in the summer, they actually descend uh, and survive in that state for the rest of the year. Um, here again, no one is quite clear what the loss of sea ice is going to have on these species, but they do seem to be dependent on it. Uh, so seabirds um, obviously are dependent on having these species to feed on if they're not there, especially at the right time of year. And this is also seen in the lower latitudes with, say, migrating songbirds, where you know the, the insect species that they're reliant on aren't there at the time of year that they've evolved to find them to feed their young. And um, this is, I think this is probably based primarily on the um, uh, Calanus species, that their production goes down with temperature, and so seeing where temperatures are going to be rising in the Barents Sea, it's anticipated, again projected, that they're going to be losing the ability to reproduce, or at least as effectively. Um, ocean acidification, we've heard a lot about, so I'm not going to go through this, uh, but here are the projections under the high emission scenario. And I think what we were hearing in the last uh, uh, presentations were that um, even under lower emission scenarios, there are going to be issues with aragonite saturation in parts of the Arctic Ocean. Um, again, projected cod production. This is something that I think uh, Peter enjoys showing in particular. Uh, to those who think that there are going to be a, you know, a large increase as these species can move further north, but this is the projection under RCP 8.5 that the larvae cannot survive these conditions. And so um, the ability to reproduce is projected to go down. So this is something that combines all of these together. And uh, even under RCP 2.6 and showing a higher ability to adapt um, it's still, you're still having quite a decrease going on with all of these various drivers. Um, and they all come together, as I said, uh, under high emission scenarios. And the question is, and the question I'm posing then to those of you who are here 
is putting all these things together, what can these marine ecosystems survive? So I'm throwing it out to anyone who wants to comment. It's almost easier to come to the podium here. Um, rather disorganized presentation of this science, but um, I would appreciate where you think we're headed when you put acidification, freshening, warming, polar migration, polewards migration of uh, lower latitude species, what is that going to mean for these polar marine ecosystems even later this century? So that's a question. I'm asking you to speculate, which I know scientists in many ways don't like to do, but uh, welcome. I'd like to take the invitation from the Inuit Council and also one of the things that Stefan gave up is I also co-lead the Ember Future Earth Coast Continental Margins Working Group where we start very locally, regionally because generalizing, the IPCC is very good for communicating to policymakers this, this, the big changes, the rates of change on a larger scale but if you're looking at ocean services, coastal services, uh, indigenous, well, indigenous communities, but also scaling it up, as I said in my presentation, to SDG relevant deliveries, my, my real hope and wish is that we can study at a much smaller scale than we do. It requires a lot more scientific effort and a lot more coordination with policy and, and community, but that's a very good thing. A lot more stakeholder intervention because to generalize about how COD, the COD will, will respond very differently in, in the Canadian archipelago or wherever when they go up there than they will in the Eastern Barents Sea. The uh, ecosystem interactions are very strange, the multiple stresses are very different. Um, so I would really like it, the sort of way we started with the AMAT report where you broke it down into into subunits, but they were still very large. We were still generalizing against the Barents Sea fishery or the Greenland Sea shrimp fishery. It would be very interesting to to accept the invitation from the local communities, not, not just the Inuit, but also our experience with the Norwegian fisheries or um, in, in the, the Cambodian fisheries, the Thai fisheries that we're doing through the CWNG that we try and piece this together so to allow some really targeted, I want to say trustworthy, but at least getting much closer to getting a, a much stronger, uh, I say prediction. But uh, So I think it's, it's not really the answer you wanted, but uh, I think that's, that's the way I would like it to see, and it's certainly the way that Future Earth Coasts uh, are moving and the IMBA human dimension and the different thematics of IMBA are working towards looking across disciplines and also bringing in stakeholders and really looking locally. I don't mean one little pond or something, but a fjord or a, a, a basin that has not geographical boundaries, but ecosystem boundaries, ecosystem service boundaries that we can try and partition and really just go and study and, right, we know, we're quite confident about the result from that particular approach. So, go on, Carol. Are you just putting your drink down? I thought you were, yes, good. <laughs> I didn't want to cop out, so um, it was <laughs> a bad one. Um, what fascinates me about the um, Arctic is that th this stuff here, this sea ice, it's basically um, a table full of food. And these little creatures ha have adapted to go along and graze the table of food. They haven't adapted to filter feed, which is what they will have to do in the future. So they're used to the delivery of very concentrated amounts of food um, that will be there in future. So it will be other species that will have to come in and take over. But 
when that food, when the ice melts seasonally, that drops to the seabed in big aggregates and big layers of also juicy food that helps feed the scallops and things there. So, I mean, you had a lovely picture of the food chain, but just imagine that the, the evolution that went into all of this. And, and then the walruses come along and they say, oh, that's a nice scallop, I'll have that. You know, so again, they've evolved into how the physics, the physical shape of the, the food web and the concentration of the particles and, and these organisms have truly evolved eating methods so it's not just um, they're not they've really evolved to fit that ecosystem, that's going to change so that's one, one thing that's quite hard to predict the other thing is you've got warming coming up and these models of, of um, increased catch potential for fisheries. But they don't really bring into account, the, uh, as, as Richard said, the acidification that's happening as well. Um, so will, will, will the Arctic be actually squashed, uh, a, a burger you know, or a sandwich? Um, squashed between a warming effect and acidification effect, and and you know where will there be an area there that is optimal for fisheries and fishing and and, and the knock-on impacts of so many birds and, and and things that depend on that fisheries is anyone's guess. And of course these migrate all around the world. So it's what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. I don't know that I can really add much to that. I agree with both Richard and Carol's sentiments. Um, I think really just it highlights how much pressure these systems will be under. Uh, when, we, when we talk about just one stress, we can think of all sorts of issues that will be impacted. Um, but put in two or three stresses on top of that, and it just complicates the matter further. So it means that we need to understand better the science but also um, the likelihood, the risk to these species is likely to be higher because they've got more than one stress. So even if they're not sensitive to acidification, they may well be sensitive to warming. Um, and we're putting, even if we don't know how sensitive these species are, um, we know that we're exposing them to a wealth of changes in conditions, freshening, uh, loss of ice, warming, acidification. They're all, ex they're all increasing stresses. And the sensitivity, in a way, doesn't matter. If we can minimize those stresses, then we just don't have to worry about how sensitive they are. And I think that's the key message for me, is that if you think of it as a risk assessment, minimizing that exposure is the best way to allowing these species to have the best chance to minimizing that risk. Um, and so that's, that's where I would say we need to really be focusing on um, understanding better how species response and how ecosystems response and how these physical changes are going to manifest in ecosystems. But actually, that's in a way, it doesn't matter too much because we don't want to put those species under that stress. We want to minimize that stress. Um, so we need to be doing something about those stresses. I'm going to lose my voice, so I'm going <laughs> to Thank you, yes, for, for sacrificing your voice. Um, I think that's actually a good note to end on, because the, the bottom line on that, how do you minimize the stress? Well, do you minimize CO2 emissions uh, and warming both. And doing that uh, most effectively, of course, is, is by decreasing emissions and aiming to keep warming to 1.5, which is part of what this is about. So um, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you back at 4 for um, a discussion of polar ocean acidification. And hopefully, Helen, <laughs> good luck with the voice. OK, thank you.
focusing on the polar oceans. And right now we're starting a new side event focusing on polar ocean acidification, highlighting issues and raising ambitions. And this is organized by the Plymouth Marine Lab and the SCCWRP. Thank you very much. Okay, we can start rolling. Um, my name is Richard Bellaby from the Norwegian Institute for Water Research and East China Normal University in Shanghai. And I'm the moderator today. Uh, maybe some of you also attended the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program acidification workshop, which we've just completed. We have a little energy left, don't we? Uh, now we have lots of enthusiasm because now we're bringing in the Southern Ocean and compare and contrast, we can take you back to your geography lessons at school. Um, so I have been asked just to be very brief. I, um, I also have a role of, I lead the uh, AMAP report and I also lead the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research Ocean Acidification action group and just to do some reporting is that you can find the AMAP report on the, uh, the AMAP certification report uh, free download you can come and see me for the link afterwards um, there has been a change in the delivery of the SCAR report though we are now coming out with a series of scientific uh, We've changed the format we will be delivering a series of scientific papers rather than a report hopefully well, most of them to the same issue so that it can be bounded and delivered by the, the publishers. There is common ground between the two. I think we are hoping to have a discussion at the end, but they are regions which are acidifying on a basin-wide scale, or in the south, a circumpolar base, or a large scale, acidifying faster than any other ocean basin or ocean. Um, they are, however, and the cause of it is, is common to both. Majority of the acidification is caused by anthropogenic CO2 uptake. There are presently some ch more other challenges, especially in the Arctic, with uh, fluvial and organic carbon supply, but that is also envisaged to happen in parts of the Southern Ocean by the end of this century if we carry on uh, pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, they have common key or foundation species and uh, Nina will talk about one of the most famous ones. Um, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to say what it is, you have to hang around and hear. Um, and one thing that we highlighted in the AMAP report was what is the most pressing urge? Uh, uh, what's the most pressing case for the Arctic? And this applies as well for the Southern Ocean and Bronte will, and Peter will, will talk about this. It's observations. There hasn't been as much focus as there should have been in the Southern Ocean, support from national and international agencies. Um, and thirdly, and this goes with observations as well, there hasn't been the community action that we have seen to be so successful in other regions. In the AMAT report, we were lucky enough to have a member of the Inuit uh, uh, Council who has really emphasized the importance of using local knowledge. There is local knowledge in the Southern Ocean. It's not from people that live there, besides the odd meteorologist on some remote island. But there are fishermen there. There are people to guide where the ecosystem services are. We should work with developed community actions. So hopefully I've satisfied a little bit of a mandate and hopefully set some of the scene for some questions afterwards. But maybe you will answer everything that I've asked over the next hour. Um, Okay, so no more to do. I have my little notes here. The first presentation, and this is also bringing this strong sense of societal community 
uh, two-way uh, communication information exchange using experts. So I'm very happy to, to welcome Martin Summercorn, who is the head of conservation for the World Wife, for WWF Arctic program. And he's also a member of the author team on the IPCC SROC report. And he's going to talk, give an overview of the climate change impacts on polar marine ecosystems from the report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. So thank you, Martin. Well, thank you, Richard, for the introduction, and also, hello for me. Thank you for being here. And as Richard said, I'm here speaking here in my capacity of coordinating lead author for the Polar Regions chapter. Um, and actually, the purpose of this report, of this um, presentation, is really just to give the context, because ocean acidification is not is not happening out of context. The polar regions are changing rapidly, they're losing ice rapidly, and uh, that has a numerous uh, consequences and, and impacts on uh, life, on people, on human systems. And uh, I would like to start this session, which I'm really, really looking forward to attending, by um, just giving you a little bit of an overview of what all else happens in the Arctic and is projected to happen in the Arctic and Southern Ocean, actually, I should say. So I give you as a first thing here the synopsis of the polar regions chapter. The polar regions are losing ice, their oceans are changing rapidly, and these changes have regional and global impacts. Why? Because the polar regions are a fundamental part of the global ocean system and of the global climate system. So what happens in these polar regions really has global impacts. The polar regions of the future will appear profoundly different depending on the degree of warming. So we do have a choice and coming back here to where we are, why we all are here, COP25 headline on action for ambition, on nature-based solution, on putting people into the center of the action. So all these three things I would like you to have in mind while we are going through these uh, presentations and through our discussions. We have a choice. We can lower and mitigate the impacts, but we cannot avoid them at this time anymore. So it's urgent time for action. And then I'm going straight into what brought us here, um, polar ocean acidification. This is a figure from the report, and it shows uh, at the top under a high CO2 future, one that is little, where emissions are little constrained or not constrained by, um, by, by policies. Uh, also called RCP 8.5 scenario, and in the lower map, uh, the uh, under a Paris compa compatible agreement uh, on a Paris compatible scenario, um, uh, a low CO2 future. And what the map de de depicts is the area of year-round undersaturation of aragonite in surface waters uh, in 2100 under each of these scenarios, um, where you don't see red that is where we don't at this point forecast year-round corrosive conditions for calcifying uh, organisms but in the polar regions we see those coming our way no matter what um, and uh, even under a low co2 future uh, there are areas where we where we will see them <clears throat> and um, under a high co2 future both polar regions are going to be massively affected so again, it is our choice uh, to go forward. Um, and I think uh, I will leave it at that for the direct ocean acidification because lots of this session will be about lots of details on that. I rather want uh, to go into the, um, the other effects of climate change. So we see these changes in context. One thing that I forgot to, that I forgot to say, we, have all, we are already seeing impacts of ocean acidification in both polar regions. Uh, the, uh, in, the, in the last 20 years, rates of calcification in the Southern Ocean have, have declined, and in the Arctic Ocean, we have seen extremes of, uh, of, uh, of ocean acidification conditions already uh, at this point. But what else happens um, in the Arctic? If, uh, if you just uh, look at the maps uh, in the top panels for, for the moment, then you see the observations, you see that we have 
lost Arctic sea ice and it has thinned and contracted for, for all months of the year. The maps here depict the September sea ice extent, which has reduced by about 13% per decade in the Arctic over the last 50 years. And this uh, condition is likely unprecedented for at least 1,000 years. The uh, sea ice and the temperature uh, the, of surface waters in the lower up graph are mutually affecting each other. You have the sea ice melt actually allowing for warmer surface ocean waters. You have also warmer surface ocean waters melting to the sea ice. Some way, one way of which is this um, is exacerbated is that we are seeing warm water coming into the Arctic Ocean through the Northern Atlantic Ocean. And all these uh, are, is actually not only affecting the ocean, but as Richard has actually already pointed to, also the polar system as such. We are seeing changes in hydrology through similar changes in snow content on land. So the, the outflow from the rivers uh, and the increased outflow from the Arctic rivers that we are already seeing and that is going to progress into the future will also affect biogeochemistry of the ocean <clears throat> and also the, um, the oceanographic conditions in the ocean. If we are looking forward, and that's depicted by the lower part of each of these graphs, we know that sea, we, the projections are for sea ice loss to continue throughout this century. Uh, it's continuing throughout at least 2050 based on the warming that we have already in the system. But after that, it actually is vastly dependent on how much uh, the, we allow the planet to warm further. So for example, for global warming of uh, 1.5 degrees, there is a probability of an ice-free September, which is the month of the least ice uh, extent in the, in the Arctic by about, for about uh, 1%. And already for a two degree root scenario, this rises to about 10% to 35%, so every third to 10th year. That is already a massive uh, difference. And if you look at some of the other um, scenarios, RCP 4.5 or RCP 8.5, then um, you see that we won't have September ice left uh, very soon in the second part of this century. And also the future ocean warm is projected to continue and here it depends very much on future greenhouse gas emissions. Let's look briefly into what that means for biodiversity, for he ecosystems, human systems and people. Now for the Arctic these responses and these impacts will not be uniform but over, on, over, across the board there will be more negative than positive. Uh, and that is because the Arctic Ocean system is not one. It has lots of regional systems that, rea that react uh, individually. Lots of sectors have different ways of, of how they respond. And the cold area is actually contracting towards the north in many, reasons, in many regions. So you see, for example, because of that, that the human system of shipping uh, has some beneficial effects because of the lo loss of ice forecasted. Um, but, uh, but in many of the, um, many of the organisms uh, categories here, you see these, um, these uh, purple um, boxes indicating that in some regions you have uh, uh, losses, in some regions you have gains of certain bi biological elements. And I come back to that in a second. Um, by and large, we are also seeing the same for primary productivity, which expands north and at the moment actually expands in some regions, contracts in others, and uh, even those, um, those uh, projecting forward on the, on the fate of, of, of uh, primary productivity is not easy uh, for the entire ocean. So um, one of the main things that must be said here is that, of course, the dominant trend is one of losing ice. And so all the, um, or the majority of, of organisms that are sea ice associated are losing habitats. Um, we are seeing shrinking populations in some parts already. And so this is a major habitat loss that is coming our way there. And all the cultural services and all the food provisioning services that are linked to these organisms are going to suffer in the future, uh, some very deeply. One way how these um, impacts actually materialize at this point, also in uh, looking at a very important uh, ecosystem services, uh, ecosystem service and, and human system fisheries, is that um, we see northwards shifts of whole communities. 
So in this case, you see in blue the Arctic fish communities, in yellow the central fish communities, and in red the boreal fish communities of the Barents Sea in, the, in northern Europe. And you see how over the last decade, between 2004 and 2012, uh, the Arctic components have really been pushed north and the boreal communities expanded. At the moment, these fisheries are still holding their catch potential, but this is actually bad news for the Arctic communities and for those cold adapted, more cold adapted fishes, for which actually at the, a little bit north of that, there is also a shelf break. So the lower, the bottom communities actually at some point will have nowhere to go. And speaking of possible thresholds in this behavior, I would also like to mention something from the report that, uh, that we shouldn't forget. Nature doesn't respond through along mean values. It responds very much along extremes. And uh, what we now know is that the Arctic and also the tropics will be centers of where we have, we will have increased frequency and increased intensity of marine heat waves. Uh, which will basically affect many of our systems directly um, and, and catastrophically. Turning quickly to the, Arctic, uh, to the Antarctic, to the Southern Ocean, we have a very different story there in terms of how we see the impacts on the cryosphere, on sea ice here. Uh, as you will see from the lower, from the upper, the maps basically of this uh, graphic, you will see that we have no clear overall trend in the, uh, uh, in the sea ice of the Antarctic, of the Southern Ocean, but we have very strong regional trends with near compensating regional losses on one side and increases on the other side of the Antarctic continent. Um, but we do not understand this system well enough that we can actually with project forward the future of Arctic, Antarctic sea ice in, with confidence. Um, the Southern Ocean is warming and it will continue to do so, but also here it's a very different system just because we have major downwelling in the Southern Ocean. The warm water, surface water is actually sinking, is, 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 per, is going downwards into deeper waters and so the, the, the basically um, the fate of the surface waters um, in, in terms of warming and in terms of affecting ice loss is less straightforward to project forward as it is in the Arctic. And, uh, as it is in the Arctic. and also here, and this is my last slide, um, we um, already see some impacts on Antarctic marine ecosystems. Also here they are not uniform, um, but we also here see more negative than positive impacts coming our way. Uh, one particular thing we are already seeing and are projecting to see more kind of positive ones in contrast to the, to the uh, Arctic case is that we, that we have many organisms that are associated to shelf seas, so the immediate ice along the Arctic, Antarctic continent, uh, where we actually see habitat expansion at the moment, colonization options. Um, whether these are transient uh, or, or, or um, can proceed will be uh, affected by how the Antarctic food chain actually reacts to the many other drivers of change also in the Southern Ocean with acidification being one of them. Antarctic krill, a center point of the Antarctic uh, marine food web, is already affected by some of the changes. We will see habitat contractions and concentrations of krill into areas uh, that are also now heavier fished. Um, and so there will be a lot of things that will come our way but we cannot see exactly yet uh, how these changes will uh, pan out for the Southern Ocean System. And so I conclude by basically saying, uh, and don't read this, I skip over it. There are many things that we can do to alleviate some of the pressures. But the prerequisite for them to be effective is really urgent, ambitious and, and sustained emission reductions. If we don't do this as a global society, we will not be able to actually alleviate those unavoidable risks that are coming our way with a lot of innovative approaches, with participation, with better science, um, with more cautious management that are coming our way. We are already seeing indications that uh, even the best management strategies for fisheries will not keep up 
will not be able to keep up with the speed of rapid ecosystem change. So that's how I would like to summarize this. Uh, there, if you have, if you are more interested in this, I uh, defer to you to the report itself. And so I conclude this, which is actually not mine, but IPCC's conclusion um, of the whole of the Cryosphere and Ocean reports. They sustain us. They are under pressure, and their changes affect all their lives. So the time for action is now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. We'll save uh, questions until the end. Um, I did, I ignored you and I read some of the other lines and I'm very happy to see adaptive governance and leading to co-production of uh, science. It's something that really should, should be on the menu. On the menu. Um, I'm very happy also for the second time this afternoon if she she has a terrible cold, Helen. This is uh, Dr. Helen fin fin uh, Findlay, a biological oceanographer from Plymouth Marine Laboratory. She will talk more about polar acidification, but talk about the readiness and, readiness and uh, the monitoring and bringing in some more uh, risk assessment. So thank you very much, Helen, and I will try and do my job properly this time. If I can find it, there it is. Come on. It's underneath, I think. Maybe I have to leave I, I can't do my job properly. So. There we go. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for um, for the speakers for being here today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current status of polar ocean acidification, give you a bit more um, of an overview of the science. I try not to complicate things too much but explain some of the chemistry. Um, as Richard said, I have a cold so if I cough or um, stutter because of that I apologise now. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how we monitor and um, some of the gaps and then think about what we can consider as a risk assessment for polar ocean acidification. So oceans are a natural sink for carbon dioxide and I think that's key for everybody to get an understanding of. Um, without the oceans taking up carbon dioxide, the atmosphere would have a lot more um, gas in it and it would be a lot warmer. The, current, the, the problem with ocean acidification is that the current uptake of atmospheric CO2 is too rapid for what we call natural buffers to prevent changes in the, in the chemistry. So over geological timescales, we would normally have carbonate chemistry buffering changes in um, CO2 and the associated chemistry. So what's happening at the present day is that rates of CO2 are going into um, the, wa the water um, at a much faster rate uh, than has been seen in the geological past for uh, about 55 million years. CO2 reacts with water to form a weak acid and that becomes hydrogen ions which we think of as pH um, resulting in a, a more acidic ocean and it's also reducing what we call carbon, carbonite ions which is really important for shelled organisms because most shells rely on these carbonate ions to form their shells um, and that's where you hear the term aragonite. Aragonite is one of the calcium carbonate minerals that's used for many shelled organisms. Um, so I just want to highlight the complexity of the polar oceans. The cold water uh, allows more CO2 to, to potentially go in because it's more gas, the gas is more soluble in those regions. But actually there's a complexity within, especially in the Arctic Ocean, where you have freshening from melting glaciers, ice sheets, um, and increased river runoff. So this, don't worry too much about the detail, but there's a whole complex series of processes that can affect the pH in these regions, including river um, inputs and freshening. And that makes it quite difficult for us to predict, but we have a lot of confidence in those predictions. Um, but it also means that a lot of the uh, regions are very variable and we have a lot of variability in the seasonal range of pH as well. Um, so this is just to highlight the current status of the pH measurements. This is an example from ship-based measurements. There's a database called GLODAP which is freely available to download. 
Um, this was the 2019 data and you can see that there's a relatively sparse um, data set. So we have a lot of measurements, but um, as you can see, there's still quite a lot of areas of the Arctic that we have very few measurements for. This isn't all the measurements we have for the Arctic, but it gives a good summary. But what you can see, particularly for the Arctic Ocean, um, the red, we, you can see the pH ranges uh, from between about 7.7 .7 up to maybe 8.3. So there's quite a high variability in pH regionally. Compared to the Southern Ocean, which you can see is mostly kind of green and yellow dots, um, so the pH is between maybe 8.1 to 8.2. So the Arctic, because of its complexity, surrounded by land, with all this freshwater influence and the ice influence, has much more regional variability um, in terms of pH and the carbonate chemistry. But as you can see, this lack of data is something that we're trying to address in the scientific world. One of the ways that we're looking at doing this is by increasing the observational cap capabilities by using autonomous um, uh, monitoring systems. So this is an example of what we call Argo floats or bio-Argo floats because they contain 